because you can start with as low as fifty dollars. So I think a lot of people when they think investing, they're like, I need thousands of dollars. I need to put hundreds of dollars each month. That's not true. I received a question from Caitlin on Instagram, and here it is. My husband and I will be debt free by the end of the year. We want to buy a house, but the housing market is crazy where we live and we don't have much saved for retirement. Should we just invest in the stock market with our extra money after the debt is gone and wait to buy a house till things cool down? Caitlin. Caitlin, thank you very much for reaching out and congratulations on being uh, working on this debt-free goal. That's super exciting and best of luck as you move towards the finish line by year's end. Now this decision you're talking about investing or buying a house, that can be a tough one. And as I say on this show a lot, it's a personal decision. So since I always think that two opinions are better than one, I thought I'd invite a post-debt-free life expert on the show today to help me answer your question. So today I'm excited to be joined by Marcus Garrett. Marcus helps people find simple ways to decrease their debt, increase their wealth, and multiply their income streams online. He's the author of Debt Free or die trying, and his expertise has been highlighted in major publications like USA Today, Market Watch, and CBS News. Welcome to the show, Marcus. And thank you for having me. I can see this polished, refined uh, introduction that you have there <laughs> on, on first read, first take. Folks. Well, this you know, first. it's uh, it's it's all about preparation, right, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. And on that time. and on that note about preparation, let's help Caitlin a little bit prepare for her next moves as she uh, hits this debt free line. So, what's a what's a smart move here for her? Investing in the stock market or buying a house? Uh, I'm going to agree with you and co-sign. Um, it's a number one, congratulations on paying off any amount of debt, but any amount of debt that you may have had. And uh, I agree with you. There's no wrong answer. It's going to be a personal decision. I'll come at it from the auditor perspective, which is my background. So I'd like to use percentages and data. So if I had some follow-up questions for Caitlin, it would be, are you buying a home to live? Is this an investment property? Um, and if I was, if it, I'm going to assume it's to live based on the the timing of the question and type of question they're asking. Plus, you said the housing market is crazy. I feel that the housing market is always crazy. It's a, you know, a, a lot of people talk about timing the stock market with the famous quote of "time in is better than timing the stock market." Uh, however, there's no way to time the housing market either. So it's it just uh, goes back to that personal choice. But Informing that with, I guess, some probability, I would say a home typically has a decent return if you plan to make it a residence and you're there for five to 10 years. Um, pretty much the industry standard as far as getting your investment back, I should say. So if you're going to keep it for that amount of time and it's a personal residence, it's a fine decision to make. Um, there's not, uh, some other clarifying questions I would have. I had an opportunity is, are, are we going to put a down payment? Are we going to put a deposit? Typically that's up to 20%. Um, assuming this is one of the higher cost markets, cause she did say it was crazy, although it seems to be crazy around the entire country. And thus I would wrap up with, you know, emphasis. Uh, this is literally in italics in my notes. Do you really have to choose? So some example saving rates, you can start with investing for retirement with this, especially with all the apps that are out there right now with as low as $50 a month. Uh, some of those apps I'll go in order of my preference here <laughs> would be uh, not paid by these affiliates. Uh, well, simple acorn, but I, I just, I bring those up because you can start with as low as $50. So I think a lot of people, when they think investing, they're like, I need thousands of dollars. I need to put hundreds of dollars each month. That's not true. Um, and then the one that I personally lose, uh, excuse me, the one that I personally use, but you need a higher investment to start off with is Vanguard. And um, that is, I think, $1,000 to start investing with Vanguard. And then if you're going to use Vanguard total stock uh, market, it's v Vita Sachs, V T S A X. <laughs> um, you need up to 3000 to start there. So because I don't know what she's working with, I, I wanted to have a few options. And when I say you don't really have to choose, it's a personal choice. You're going to pay off debt, so you're already making these debt allocations. And usually when I have a question like this, I use the 80-20 rules. So you were already, let's say, using, I'll use 1000 because it's easier math. You're already paying $1,000 a month for your, um, to pay off debt. Let's take 800 of that and put that towards your home savings and then 20% towards your retirement savings. That way you're not spending any more money, yet you're accomplishing both goals. And then finally, uh, another thing that I find people that they don't consider is, you know, is there an employer match out there? So that way you don't even have to put all of your money up front. So 
to revisit, you can start with as low as $50 with some lots of investment apps out there. I would start with Wealth Simple because they can do as low as $50. If you have about $1,000 to start with, let's start with Vanguard because they're, it's, I think I saw you actually talking about on Twitter, their platform isn't very technically savvy, but it gets the job done. And I'm not a technically savvy person, so it's very simple for me. Uh, took me about 15 minutes to set it up. And then number three, let's see if you have an employer match out there. Let's just take that debt savings that you are already spending each month, divide it by 80-20, put 80 towards whatever your savings goal may be, and 20% towards your retirement savings. I love this advice. And one thing that that you, you pointed out, which I think is fantastic, sometimes people think it's a black or white decision, right? I can either invest or I can save for a home or buy a home. I love your point on why not both? Why can't we do some of both? And I think that's the whole point. The earlier we start with investing, time and compound interest can really help us. So even if we're starting with the 50 bucks or the thousand right. bucks or whatever you can get into, developing that habit, building it up. And hey, if you can use a fintech app like Acorns or Wealth Simple to make it easier for you, just to get rid of that, well, I don't know much about investing. Hey, man, these apps, these things can make it so much easier for you. Is, is this a typical question that you find? You know, you you, you 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 often talk about this sort of post-debt-free life. Is this a typical struggle point that you found for people in, in your community or people you've talked to through your platforms? Yes, I, I hear this question all the time, and I, I agree with you. And it, maybe it's because of what we're taught. Um, most people just, they think it's an end and or scenario, uh, or I guess in this case, it'd be or they, they think that they have to save in the stock market, they have to save retirement, like can't do both. And I think when people really break it down and look at what their priorities are, and going back to that personal choice, putting that personal and personal finances, they really have more options than they realize, especially for someone like this, who's already been making what I'll call the sacrifice to pay off debt you're already used to allocating money towards likely something that you wouldn't want to be spending your money towards. <laughs> so it's really just repurposing it. Um, I remember when I was getting out of debt, I think at my highest point towards the end, I was paying like $1,500 a month because, but I mean, also, but also by that point, I just wanted to be done. So I was putting $1,500 a month towards debt payments. And that's, you know, a pretty good chunk of change when you start talking about retirement, when you start talking about a home where you're going to be investing over a 30 year span, you can do a lot with that savings. And people have been so focused on just paying off debt, I, I think it takes a mindset shift to be like, oh, there's different ways I could divvy up this money and I've already been making this sacrifice. Yeah, T talk to me about your story a little bit, Marcus, because I think that's super interesting, $1,500. I, I don't know if it started at that point for you or did you find ways to increase your income, decrease your expenses to be able to get to that level? Increasing my income is something I focus on now, but coincidentally, I started at age 27. So I graduated school. Now I'm start dating myself. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try not to use years. So I graduated school at age 22 and had $9,000 in credit card debt. I then um, got a consolidation loan. Allegedly, I applied for a consolidation loan that was supposed to pay off that $9,000 in debt. And I thought that they would, I'm, I'm but yeah, I'm 22. So I thought they were going to pay off the debt for me and I would just have my monthly, you know, one low monthly consolidated plan. Like, you know, it said in the marketing material, they sent me this check and I, <laughs> it was the most amazing thing. I had only made $9 an hour. Like that was the most money I'd ever made in my entire life. So I had never seen a check that large. It was either 10,000 or 15,000, which, you know, the fact that I can't name the amount tells you how much, how vested I was in this check. Didn't read any of the fine print. And so I spent it all. Uh, I went out, uh, bought me in uh, college bay of a bunch of material possessions that you know, did not accumulate in assets or value uh bought me a car with rims that also didn't accumulate in value and i just basically spent the entirety of the check i think i paid off one credit card and so in that one weekend i went from thousand dollars in debt to twenty six thousand dollars in debt and you know i'm 22 just graduated college with a business degree so i'm like you know who cares i'm about to go out here and get this you know any money there's nothing to me this little pocket change i'm not worried about it and it took me seven more years to pay off that debt. And that's what the, ultimately I ended up writing about and I talk about now. And, and now I'm on the other side of the, the wrong side of 30, but the other side of the hill. I, I could talk to young people and children all around the country. And honestly, men, women, and adults about, you know, 
you can be down pretty bad and still have a comeback. You know, I, I was down, you know, uh, whatever metaphor you want to use in the fourth, <laughs> you know, it, it was halftime. The score was a uh, three to 28. You know, everybody was like, he's not going to make a comeback and you know, started, started driving down the field. So that, that was my comeback story. Then I ultimately ended up writing a book called debt free or die trying. And I ended up paying off that debt by age 30 and to, to give how important that is, I accumulated all that debt, first of all, in like 72 hours. Took seven years to grow it. I actually didn't even pay it off. I got a few more flat screen TVs. I, you know, I, I still like flashy things. And, but eventually, when I finally made the choice, like, I'm going to pay down my debt, it only took me from 27 to 30. And to answer your question a different way, I had also, I want to say quadrupled, but definitely tripled. I, I know I negotiated a 40% raise because I moved to Denver for that raise. So I, I definitely increased my salary 40%. And um, over the t- course of two years, I increased my salary 400%. Uh, and I had an interview with Yahoo Finance talking about that. So I was fortunate that while I was making all these financially irresponsible decisions, I was actually still holding down a job. <laughs> and maybe I had to, maybe it was, a, it was a matter of circumstance. I was increasing my salary that whole time. So I definitely encourage people if there is an opportunity to, again, take that two-pronged approach. Like you don't just have to pay off debt. What can you be doing in your life to increase your income along the way? It actually does uh, make things easier. Money doesn't buy happiness, but neither does poverty. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, so, so there was a point you said, I think at 27 in the story where you said, Enough's enough. I got to get rid of this. What happened in your life where you said, all right, uh, this is enough. I got to change this. I remember I was I was asking for my second consolidation loan. So, you know, for those keeping score at home, that's five years down the line, 22. So I'm now I'm 27. And for those who are either at 27 or past 27, you know, the wisdom that comes with 27. You start seeing 30 knocking at the door. And I was like, you know, I, I need to get my life together. And I was working three jobs at that time. And I was still struggling paycheck to paycheck because I wasn't making P. Diddy money like I thought I would. <laughs> <laughs> and I probably need a, met- a different metaphor because I don't know. I don't even know if people know who P. Diddy is. <laughs> I'm good, time, buddy. I'm in my late 30s. I got you. <laughs> exactly. He was my hero. You know, I thought I'd be white parties, you know, on the other side of the yacht. And we'd be pointing at each other from one side of the yacht to the other. Never quite worked out that way. <laughs> and um, it, it, took me now at that realization i was working i was selling iphones at the time actually uh working at a wholesale chain putting a computer together and i had a nine to five i did a few of these jobs part-time and i was still struggling to make ends meet and so i called up a consolidation loan at an organization that i'm still mad at and don't do business with and <laughs> and i uh, asked them for a consolidation loan and he he asked me a series of what are now basic questions to be like, what are your credit score? Um, you know, how much income do you make? How much outstanding credit do you have? What is your utilization rate on your, on your credit? And I didn't know the answer to anything. It's like, it's like if you sat down for the SATs and you only knew your answer, uh, your, your first and last name, you got to question one, you realize you didn't know question two. Like that's how it felt. I was like, golly. And I just felt so, I call it rock bottom in the book, so bad about that situation, so uninformed and and so ill-prepared for adulting that I was like, I'll never let this situation happen again. And I also realized at one point when he put me on hold that I had no plan B, which I talk about a lot now, that if he came back and said no, I had nothing. There was no other option. I, you know, there's only so many hours in the day. I'm working three jobs. Like I, I, I realized during that call, I had nothing else. I needed him or this entity to say yes, or who knows? Cause fortunately they did come back and say yes, but I'm pretty sure bankruptcy would have been how this story took a, another turn. Uh, so that was what happened to me at age 27, that very traumatic PTSD event. And I was like, you know what? Um, what I did is I went to bankrate.com. I actually, first of all, I, this is very key to the story, also dating myself. I went to Yahoo. I'm not even sure Google was out yet. <laughs> I distinctly remember searching Yahoo to figure out where I needed to go. And I ended up at bankrate.com slash calculate S. And I still recommend to this day, I started building what would ultimately become my debt-free plan. I love it. And you made that plan. You continued to increase your income as we talked about controlled your expenses and in three years you were debt free at that point when you were debt free did you develop the skills to say 
hey, I'm going to now make this money work for me. What did you do with that money? Obviously, to Caitlin's point in the beginning, what did you decide <laughs> to do with your extra money? I would love for that answer to be yes, Andy, that now at 30, I had all the wisdom and, and necessary skills to tackle the world. But no, uh, and I, I've actually found this also happens a lot. I spent so many years, and maybe Caitlin in as well is as well, focused on just getting out of debt. I hadn't really been planning for anything else. Um, I do recall uh, TIA Cref. I'm not even sure if they're still around. <laughs> you know, I'm dropping these names. These businesses probably don't. They've been like conglomerates now and everything like that. People are like, does that even exist? But they had come to my job coincidentally, and they. Uh, I remember going to the room, and no one was there, and they opened up what. It turned out to be an index fund. I didn't even know. Like they filled out all the paperwork for me. Here's another thing I found over the years that when it comes to taking your money, people are always excited to do so. <laughs> so they helped they helped me fill out all the paperwork. Uh, and actually, they they did a great service. So they opened up what turned out to be my first index fund. But I didn't have like any kind of strategic planning behind it. What they did is they rolled over an old, I believe it was a 401k, but it might have been a pension. But see, see, I didn't even know. They filled out all the paperwork for me. <laughs> <laughs> they are just like sign here, here, and here. And it has turned out over the years that it is very simple to do so. I've wrote like five since that time. But it was probably my later 30s before I started becoming more strategic and purposeful about my investment strategy. And we had um, Jonathan, I forget his last name, it starts with an M, but from ChooseFi. And he really articulated in a very simple way is getting out of debt gets you back to broke. And I was so focused on getting out of debt. I wasn't, you know, looking to my financial future. I wasn't planning for retirement. Uh, beyond any services that were offered by my job, I was just kind of meandering through life and I was happy to pay off debt. And then what happened was I didn't, I thought I was there, but really I just made it back to broke. I was back at zero. So I was not negative 30, but I was back at zero. So then plus five more years of wisdom and pain, I started making more purposeful decisions and focusing on building my net worth and focusing for saving and investing for the future. And ultimately what is now my focus is, you know, building and establishing a legacy. That's incredible. I love it. And I understand, you know, even some of your advice in the beginning, uh, this investing journey doesn't have to be overly complicated, overly tricky, knowing all the, the ins and outs of you know, single stocks or crypto or whatever, it sounds like an index fund became an easy way for you to get going. If somebody's listening right now and they've got that extra money, they're, they're, they're getting to that point of debt-free and they want to start investing, but they, they have that confusion point. What do I do? What do you think is a, a simple way for somebody to start getting investing today? I would look at it two ways because ultimately I, I use that savings um, in 2021 to start my own business, but that's because that's what I was personally interested in. But I was personally interested in it because, and it's actually proven to be true, at, again, age 27, another thing I did is I looked at my income. So I've been in the public sector for a number of years. So the good and the bad of that is you can look at your pay scale for the next 25 years. And I took out an Excel spreadsheet and I looked at my pay scale if I had at that time stayed in that pay band for the next 25 years or whatever my investment would have or my vesting would have been. And I dragged it down if I got a 1% raise, a 3% raise, and I think a 6% raise, which I think I've never gotten. <laughs> and I looked at that number at the bottom and it wasn't very big. It was actually smaller than what I make now. And I was like... I think I need to do something different here. And so I started looking at ways to diversify my income and multiply my income streams. But that ultimately proved to be interesting to me. Uh, and another kind of factoid that I saw years later is that the average American, I think by age 48, will see their income plateau, meaning that but for cost of living increases, if they exist in their pay band, they're, um, so they'll make effectively that pay rate for the rest of their career. And I started to see that at age 27, and I started looking for ways to diversify. As far as investments, I did what kids, I call them kids because they're younger than me, are doing now. You know, I tried all the things. I lost a lot of money trying to invest in like stocks and pick the right businesses and just get it right. Uh, time the market, as I said about earlier, lost a bunch of money. And then ultimately what I just realized is for me, the type of investment uh, in investment person I am and that I don't want to monitor stocks. I honestly don't even want to think about it or look at it too much <laughs> from, from day to day is I'm an ind index fund guy. I am fine with the market averages and I had to take a step back 
read 15 books along the way to, to, to validate the decision because of who I am. And that's that's what I use now. Um, and I use a retirement target date index fund. Um, I have a pension fund through my employer, which for those who aren't uh, familiar, is the equivalent, the public sector's uh, equivalent of a, a 401k, effectively a retirement fund. And then I manage my own account uh, through Vanguard because it has low fees and it allows me to um, basically tap into, I think it's indexed to the S&P 500. And that, that's exactly my point. I log in like once a quarter. I, I, I have automated payments. I automate everything because I still know who I functionally am. I'm still that, uh, uh, I'm on the wrong side of 30, but I'm still that kid that likes big rims. So I got to take myself out of the process. I allocate the percentage that I want to go to savings and investment, and then I play with the rest. To get out of debt, I was on a 50, 30, 20 budget. I'm sure you talked about a lot on the show, but it's 50 for need, it's 30 for wants, 20 for savings and investing. And now I'm on an 80, 20. So I still do 20 for saving and investing, but I just, I have fun with the 80% because I feel like it's been earned. I th- I've been through all these trials and tribulations. Um, I'm, I'm on the other side of the hill where I try to enjoy my money and, and, and grow my money through multiple income streams. I love that, Marcus. And you, you talked about investing in two different ways. You talked about investing in yourself with your business and investing in the stock market for your retirement or just your fun over the next couple, couple of decades. I think that's important for people to think about investing not so singularly as well. Like for stock market, this could be real estate investing. This could be an entrepreneurial adventure. This could be investing in your education. What ways are you taking that extra money now that you are debt-free or moving on your way towards debt-free to invest in a better life for you now or in the future? So I think this is a fantastic message, Marcus. Thank you so much for your time today. If people want to get in touch with you, where's the best place for them to go? And I understand you got an awesome podcast too, so tell people where to go. I appreciate it. Um, so for the, anyone watching this on YouTube, uh, you can actually find me at youtube.com slash the Marcus Garrett. I'm universally branded under the Marcus Garrett. Uh, you can join the community newsletter at the Marcus Garrett.com slash show. I'll email you my free guide on how much debt you can afford on a 30, 50 or a hundred thousand dollar salary. It's one of my most popular articles. People ask about it all the time. And I update that data every quarter based on the cost of living index and salary negotiation tools. And you can find The Marcus Garrett Show on your favorite podcast or wherever you're listening to this podcast where I have weekly entertaining conversations with your favorite influencers and entrepreneurs named or nominated for Best New Personal Finance Podcast of 2021. Absolutely. And I'm excited to to see you in person. And I hope that uh, that award goes your way, man. That'll be fantastic. And uh, buddy, I look forward to seeing you next week. And thank you so much for your time today. Thank you.